God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, we just we just had Brother Stephen and Sister Emily. They went out to Michigan. They ended up preaching these two different services, and one got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and another one received the Holy Ghost at every service. <laughs> My God. <clears throat> God is moving, it's exciting, and uh, just want to just give God thanks because they raised everything but $2,000 for their funding for Malaysia from this, these two events. God is good. All right, so uh, opening up to Isaiah 64 and 8, you don't have to turn with me, I'm on a time limit. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. <clears throat> I started thinking, uh, my wife and I, we just purchased a house, and there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. And so I'm like, I, I feel like I'm an artist at times, <clears throat> but I'm like, this is where it's dangerous if you're an artist. Because then now you're like, there's so much that can happen. There's so much that we can do. And I don't want to do it. But it, it just pops out. And so I started thinking about making stuff and creating things that are odd or different, out of the norm, not traditional, just, just random stuff. And then I started di uh, diving into pottery, like just thinking about pot I don't do pottery. I'm just saying the idea, the idea crossed my mind about pottery. And so I... I looked into the understanding that if you take pottery and you put it in, you know, everybody's heard the il illustration. You put potter or pottery into, into the, the fire or the clay into the, the fire and you got to turn it up. And I didn't know that if you take it out too early, it makes it weak and unstable. But at the same time, if I were the clay, I wouldn't want to be in that fire at all. But it's because of that fire that it becomes stronger, that it becomes something that's, in, in, in my hands, would be something really weird, like a, a cup that's like this high on one side and this low on the other side, just something that's just out of the normal. But then I started breaking down paintings as well. I'm like, my pottery, it would take forever. I'd start, and then I'd get distracted, and then I'd, I'd go back and try to fix it, and then I'd have to redo what I messed up the first time. And so I started digging into just paintings, did you know the Last Supper, it took three years to make? My supper would not take that long. <laughs> My suppers are halfway gone while I'm making it. The, it from 1495 to 1498. But then I was like, the Mona Lisa, it took seven years to complete one painting. It was four years, and then it was posted, which was actually unfinished. Then he finished it later on. So it took three years after that. So seven years to complete. And then I heard the terminology, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And I hear these different things letting me know that to create a masterpiece, it's going to take time. To create something perfect, it will take time. I looked at Joseph and David in the Bible, and I see Joseph, it, it basically states like 13 years of him just going down, going down in the prison, being sold into slavery, being betrayed, being lied on. All these things different. All these things happen for 13 years, and then now he gets elevated. I was like, okay, that's a that's a cool story. Then I looked at David's life. He was out in the he was out in the wilderness, singing, doing his thing. He fought a lion. He fought a bear. He fought Goliath. And I'm thinking, all this time bringing him up to Goliath. He's still young. We like to stop at Goliath. David has a whole life after that where he got victory after victory after victory. But all of these things that led up to that point was his training ground, his being stuck in an oven. If we get out of the fire too fast, if we are the clay and we get pulled out of the fire too fast, we can turn into a Saul. We can be elevated too fast and pride can take over. We can look at Judas. He was given his opportunity, but greed took a hold of him. And so I, I want to stop this with one little saying that you all can join in with me if you know this. There's two parts. It says, there really ought to be a sign upon my heart 
Don't judge him yet. There's an unfinished part. But I'll be better just according to his plan, fashioned by the master's loving hand. In the mirror of his word, reflections that I see, makes me wonder why he never gave up on me. But he loves me as I am, and he helps me when I pray. Remember, he's the potter. I'm the clay. And if you know this next part, sing it with me. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. The sun, I got one. The sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. Because he's still working on me. How many knows God's still working on your life? Amen. Who loves awesome preaching? Amen. <laughs> Man. Come on, that's okay. We got one of the greatest examples right here. Thank you. And it's not said much, but thank you for this honor because you give permission for me to stand behind this pulpit. So thank you. <clears throat> Yep, he gives you permission to listen to me. I <laughs> uh, want to go to a verse, uh, Esther 4, 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We'll give you a little backstory here. Uh, in Esther, the third and fourth chapter, Haman, a real evil man, was plotting to kill the Jews, completely wipe them out. All right. <clears throat> he, had it, he had permission from the king, go ahead and do what you got to do. So Haman decided to cast lots with his homies. When is this going to take place? When, when are we going to be able to do this? So they're casting lots, right? And they come up with the month of Adar. I believe it's the 13th day in the month of Adar. Yeah. <clears throat> this is when it's going to take place. This is when we're going to destroy this nation, wipe them off the face of the earth. So he goes to the king, gets him to sign off on this royal decree so they can send it out amongst the entire Persian empire. Now, the day this gets sent out is the month of Nisan, Nisan, Nisan. It's the first month of the of Jewish year. On the 14th day of that month, the Israelites celebrate Passover. So imagine here with me, fathers telling their sons the story of how God passed over them because they had the blood of the lamb painted on their doorposts. And God saved them and delivered them from Egypt. But yet at the same time, he gets a decree. He gets a knock on the door. Got this royal decree for you here. Be prepared. You and your family are going to die. So Haman finds out about this, obviously. He goes to Esther because Esther's the queen. And she has an in with the king, right? He says, Esther, you got to tell the king. You got to go and do something because if you don't, we're all going to die. But she says, well, listen, you can't go into the king's office without him saying, come on in. Even though I'm the queen, I can't get, I don't get real favors like that. That doesn't happen. And he says, listen, if you don't do it, you're dead anyway. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. You're dead anyway if you don't. And so most of us know the story. She goes to the king. She gets the royal scepter held out so she can come in. And so she begins to plead with the king. Haman's plot gets overturned, all right? He gets hung from his gallows that he was going to hang Mordecai from. Apologize if I messed that up there. But, um, but here's what I really want to get at, is that each and every one of us has been called to the kingdom 
for a certain time. The nation of Israel was depending on Esther to do something. They were crying out and depending on her to do something. She was called for the kingdom for such a time as this. Pastor Stephen, I got I to gotta say, and, I, and I've seen it, how many people in Malaysia were crying out to God to send somebody? And yet here you are, you and your family are going. Pastor, how many people in the Chicagoland area have been crying out for an apostolic church, an apostolic presence in this community, in this city, all over Chicagoland area, for you have been called for such a time as this. Brother Williams, how many prisoners have been crying out for somebody? And yet here you are, all the way from Florida, for such a time as this. Every single buddy here has been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. You know what your purpose is. We just heard on Sunday, you don't give up. You keep moving forward. You don't live in fear. God has got your back. You have the favor. The scepter has been pulled out just for you. This is your time. This is your calling. There are people depending on each and every one of us to do what God has asked us and called us to do. He's got our back. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So I ask you, as we end today, I, I urge you and urge you, there are people depending on you. You were called for this moment. Can we stand as we go back, before we go back into worship? Oh, the presence of the Lord is so rich, isn't it? <laughs> so I just found out what happens when I touch the top of my surface against the side of the pulpit. It shuts it off. <laughs> Probably shouldn't slide it up that far. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm going to read a scripture here in a bit, but I want to introduce what that scripture is with some background on this message a few weeks ago a number of scriptures were brought to my attention through different means and began to meditate on those scriptures of what God was trying to speak to me about then this past prayer meeting that we had just two weeks ago I guess it would be two Saturdays ago coming up I was praying about something very specific and I was praying, seeking God about it. And right at the end of the prayer, I was sitting right over here in this front pew, this front uh, chair. And I felt God began to speak to me, not so much as a chastisement, but more of a, hey, pay attention to what I'm trying to say to you. He said, you're praying safe prayers you got to stop praying safe prayers. It's like, hmm, okay. He said, I've come and I've taken the chains off your hands, but you choose to continue to carry the weight of the chains with you. I've come and I've opened the prison doors for you, but you choose to stay inside the cell. Whoa. because it's safe. Still a prison, but it's comfortable. We know the surroundings, we understand what it is. One of the challenges I believe, and Brother Williams, you could speak to this more directly, but I've heard that one of the challenges with prisoners being released is they don't know how to navigate with freedom. We, the children of God, the Bible says, 
whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But too many times we choose to remain in the bondage that he's already liberated us from. In that thought concerning this, my thoughts went to the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. And I would have you play through the whole message so whenever you're tired, you can, you can stop. I would. I just I enjoy, you know, music. David played music and calmed Saul, and so that music helps calm me. I thought of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Have you ever read the book? Anybody here read the book, seen the movie? In the book, there's a central character whose name is Aslan. Aslan is an allegorical representation of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, who wrote these books, devout Christian, made no bones about what he was trying to illustrate. And in one conversation, and you have to understand, you know, this is fiction and all that kind of stuff, and you can go ahead and put that slide up there, please. Um, you know, we understand that beavers don't talk to people. <laughs> all right, not normally. You know, God made a donkey talk, and I get that, but normally, I mean, if you're walking through a zoo and you come up to the beaver cage or whatever they call that, and the beavers walk over and say, hey, Brother Goff, how you doing today? I, I think either one of two things. You think, what did they put in my Coke? Or, uh-oh, I better go look for the people in white coats because something has happened here. So we understand this is fictional and all that kind of stuff. But Susan is talking about Aslan. And Mr. Beaver said, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan. Yeah, everybody's thinking of another movie there. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I feel, shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. You think, what does that have to do with what you've been talking about so far? See, we have this image of God as being this kindly grandfather. Brother Goff, on Sundays, the kids flock to him because he walks around with a five-pound bag of candy. <laughs> Kindly grandfather, and, you know, no disrespect for, to Brother Goff. I, I appreciate what he does. The kids love it. He loves doing it. But God is not Brother Goff in the sense that he's a kindly grandfather walking around handing out candy. God is not safe. He's never been safe. The only he, reason he's safe is because we put him in a box so that we can manage him. But when we do that, we restrict God from being who he is. If I only allow God's intellect to equal mine, if I only allow God's power to equal mine, if I only allow God's understanding to equal mine, then to a certain extent, I don't need God. And that's the, consider, that's the circumstances and situations of our world today. The church has put God in a box and made him safe so long that the world no longer fears God because he's not at all unsafe. That's not the world's fault. That, the world didn't put him in a box. The church put him in a box. As an example of what I mean, I'm going to read for you, and you can see it on the screen, from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. It says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Does anybody know these verses? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Many of you can probably quote this. 
You might have come from a religious background for, where every Sunday or every service you attended, they would quote this as part of their service structure. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. It's a beautiful, beautifully written, stated, almost poetic. And we can get lured into a sense of safety and security when we simply quote what is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. But this is not a safe prayer to pray. If you really pray what Jesus said to pray, if, if you felt and believed that this is a prayer to pray as opposed to an explanation on how to pray, if you want to incorporate this into your daily devotions, it's fine. But when you begin to repeat the words, you've got to understand that you've got to do more than just repeat the words because this is a dangerous prayer. The New International Reader's Version said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. May what you want to happen be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Weymouth, New Testament. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father who art in heaven, may thy name be kept holy. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done in earth, so on, in, in heaven, so on earth. Give us today our day, bread for the day and forgive us of our shortcomings as we also have forgiven those who have failed in their duty toward us. And bring us not into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. In the book of Luke, that's from Matthew. In the book of Luke, Luke records it slightly different. In Matthew, it's part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus begins to talk, talk about what we call the Beatitudes. And then after he gets done talking about the Beatitudes, he begins to address other situations and subjects. And the sixth chapter we come, and he begins to talk about alms and making sure that when you give alms, give your offerings, that you do it appropriately. And then he begins to talk about prayer. And when you're going to pray, make sure you do it appropriately. And then he begins to talk about other subjects all the way through the seventh chapter. But in Luke, it's interesting that Luke records in chapter 11, verse 1, and it came to pass that as he was praying, everybody say, he was praying. Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he ceased, so he is praying, he got done with praying. And when he got done, one of the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. This thought struck me when I read that. I'd never hit me this way before. The disciples were devout Jewish believers. Believers in the sense of the Old Testament, not New Testament. They had been trained and taught in the synagogues. They had done their, their duty in the temple, probably repeated at times. They probably, as young men, sat in the synagogue and heard the elders debate the scriptures and verses and the meetings of various words. They sat through all the Passovers that were mentioned already and learned the statements that were said and repeated through the Passover as a reminder of what God had done. These men were not men who were ignorant of the Old Testament. Yet, here these adult Jewish believers when they saw and heard Jesus pray, immediately recognized that they didn't know how. That struck me, it really, because Jews had prayers that they prayed all the time. It was part of their, if you will, liturgy. It was part of what they did. They would pray things and repeat things, and the priest would say things, and the congregation would say things, and in the home, the father would say things, and the youngest man would say things. On and on is part of a prayer. But when Jesus prayed, they saw and heard that and went, wow, we don't know what that is. And he said, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's interesting when you break down the parts of the Lord's Prayer, you find that what Jesus did is he actually reached, remember, Jesus was also trained 
in the ways of the Jewish faith. He knew all the prayers. He knew all the, the sacraments. He knew all the, the liturgy, all the things that they did. He understood all that. And so when he began to teach his disciples after this manner, pray ye, he began to reach into the Jewish culture and pull out phrases in prayers that the Jewish people prayed on a regular basis. So when he said this statement about hallowed be thy name, it was a phrase that the Jews understood because they repeated it in their prayers. That may not mean much to you at the moment, but you have to understand that what Jesus was doing, it was he was uh, using what they were familiar with to bring about a new method, if you will, of prayer. But using the foundation of what they already understood, but he changed what he said. Do you remember when they gathered in the upper room and there was a comment about the Last Supper taking how many years to paint? Three? Well, I, you know, well, I guess that was Derek, wasn't it? That's why Elias went, I don't know. <laughs> Three years, right? Well, at the Last Supper, they ate. They were partaking of communion, correct? Not what we call communion. They were partaking of the Passover feast. And in the middle of that, he takes the bread and breaks it. Not uncommon. But now he changes the common to uncommon when he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. He takes the cup likewise, and he says, he blesses it, and he says, this is my blood. He took a familiar and inserted it in a way into a new covenant that caused them to go, whoa, what is he doing? He's not praying the prayer he's supposed to be praying. He's not saying the words he's supposed to be saying. He's changing this up. And in the Lord's prayer, he does the same thing. Hallowed. This our Father which art in heaven, it identifies his omnipresence. It makes reference in that phrase to the majesty and dominion of God. It speaks of his power and his might. It talks and references to his omniscience, his all-knowingness. Can I just encourage you right now with one little thing that's not in my notes? Satan is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He cannot be in any place other than one at any one time. So when we say, well, Satan was really bothering me, no, he wasn't. One of his lesser imps were. Uh, okay, is that all right? You understand what I'm saying there? He's not omniscient. He's not, he doesn't understand what we're thinking. I believe it was, was it Brother Stone King or, or maybe Brother Hernandez? We were at your house for a meeting before, I don't know exactly what it was before. It was it Hernandez? And he was talking about speaking things out loud. Because Satan can't read your mind. None of his little demons run around trying to hurt you and cause you fear and anxiety. They can't read your mind. But when you begin to speak things, they can hear that and they begin to attach themselves to that and begin to prey on you for your words. So if you say, oh, I'm just very fearful. Oh, here comes the spirit of fear. Man, I am just so sick I can't hardly stand it. And what it comes, here comes a spirit of disease. Now, I understand we talk about those things. You have to say, hey, Brother Goff, I, I'm not feeling well. Can you pray for me? But don't confess disease. Confess healing. Because Satan doesn't want anything to do with the confession of healing or deliverance or overcoming or miracle. He wants to attach himself to the confessions of fear and disease and hurt and harm. Whew. Albert Barnes writes of this phrase, Hallowed be thy name. Let thy name be celebrated, venerated, and esteemed as holy everywhere and receive from all people proper honor. We take that first part and we consider it worship. It is, but it's prayer. 
We're not just saying that how would be your name. No, we are invoking a request to the Almighty that in the world in which we live and breathe and move, that his name be so honored that all people would come to an understanding of the power and authority associated with his name. I, I hope this is okay, Pastor Betcher, but I'm going to meddle for just a little bit. There are terms that have become popular and acceptable in our world that should have no place in the vernacular of a Christian. I got to tell you, I'm speaking by permission and not by commandment, so I'm going to step over here. I got to tell you, I am so sick of OMG. It's the Christian world has become less committed and less respectful of God than at any time that I can ever remember. Brother Williams, as a kid, if I ever said, oh my God, and I wasn't praying, singing, worshiping, or something, my parents would have taken me and washed my mouth out with soap. Oh my God, oh my Lord. That has no part in your vernacular. I said I was meddling. I hope it's okay. Because I already did. <laughs> how would be, how can we as Christians say, let thy name be exalted in all the world, and then say, oh my God? <laughs> can bitter water flow? With sweet? Who? Thy kingdom come. In the time in which Jesus lived, you have to understand that they were under Roman oppression, severe oppression. There were people within the Israeli culture that were disappointed and upset when Jesus did not establish an earthly kingdom, because they thought, mistakenly, that's what he had come for. Pilate was a little confused by that, too, and Jesus had to sort of set him straight. My kingdom was this world, then would my servants fight, right? Thy kingdom come, it wasn't a battle cry of a revolution. The word here actually means rain, not rain down from the sky, but rain as king. More like Esther going in before the king. John Gill writes of this phrase, the form of expression used by the ancient Jews relating to this article before the coming of Christ, doubtless was as it now stands in their prayers. What he's saying is the Jewish people would pray a prayer and this, listen to this, listen to this phrase they would use in their prayer. The kingdom of thy Messiah come. It may seem a small thing, but Jesus said, thy kingdom come. He took a phrase they understood and then pulled the word out. Why? Because Messiah had come. He wasn't praying for the Messiah's kingdom to come. He was instructing his disciples to say, thy kingdom come. It's here and it's me. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And this is where this prayer, if you really pray it, this gets downright scary. See, the God that we worship in worship service and we enjoy his presence, that's a safe God. Now, you may not fully understand what I'm saying by that, but see, at any point in time, I can dial it down. But, Brother Smet, when I, in honesty and sincerity, come before God and say, Thy will be done, this is serious stuff now. Because what if his will takes me to Malaysia? Huh? 
Huh? What, what if my, his will takes me to my next door neighbor who I've had arguments with over the positioning of their fence or the barking of their dog? And now Jesus Christ wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, my will is for you to go witness to that man because he needs healing. Now what do I do? See, for me to pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven is indicative of the fact that anything he says in heaven is done just the way he declares it. But that's not happening in the earth because I get my will in the way. And so when I really pray the Lord's Prayer and I say, thy will be done, my will has to break. And that's not Safe. Who shot out of my car? See, his will is his law. We don't like laws. We're liberated from law. Jesus did away with that in the New Testament. Really? See, we have this misconception. I'm, I'm going to mess, just listen to me out. Hear me out. I believe in tithing. I have paid tithes since I was five years old. Maybe four. I don't remember the first time I paid tithes. But Brother Williams, I've been paying tithes for 60 years nearly. I believe in tithing. But see, we're copping out if all we're doing is tithing. Because the New Testament says everything belongs to him. It's not 10%. If I only give 10%, he's letting me off on a bargain. If I pray, Brother Elias, thy will be done, and he says, you know that paycheck you got Friday? I want it all. And we're not speaking in tongues. His will and praying that, my friends, is dangerous. Oh, hear me, please. See, we cannot take the fulfillment or obedience to his will only from a world view. We have to take that view of his law. Well, keep your laws off my body. Whose laws are we talking about? Man's laws? Okay. I'll grant you that. Man can pass a law. Man can reject a law. But you don't go to God and say, you know what? I don't like that law. So, if it's all right with you, which it isn't, I'm not going to do that. Because I consider that to be intrusive into my life. Huh. Sorry, Abigail, it's Wednesday. I'm not supposed to walk around. Again, quoting from Albert Barn Barnes, the object of these three first pet petitions is that God's name should be glorified. We like that. Glorify the Lord. Make joyful. Oh, that's good. And that his kingdom be established. We struggle a little bit more with that. Because who normally sits on the throne of our lives? Brother Oscar does. Everybody's. <laughs> you know, er earlier today I was praying and this thought about Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane came to my mind. Not my will, but thine be done. And we understand it was, oh, he sweat as it were, great drops. of. I, I can't imagine. And what came to me is, you all ha experienced what it felt like to be guilty of sin. Does anybody remember what that felt like? 
Do you remember the first time? I shouldn't say it that way. Do you remember going into the waters of baptism and the, for the first time when you came out, you were completely free from that burden of guilt? Now consider what Jesus was praying, not my will but thine be done. He was going to take upon himself your guilt and all the weight that you just clapped about being released. He was going to take all of that plus your neighbors, plus the people behind you, plus the people in front of you, plus the people that lived 4,000 years previous and the people that lived 2,000 years after. How many billion people are in the world right now? How many billion people have lived who will live? How many billion sins came upon him? It is no wonder that crushing weight came upon him and his capillaries began to burst and mix with the sweat as it came down his, his brow. And I struggle to be transparent, with coming to him and submitting my measly little insignificant puny animus will to him. Why? Because it's not safe. It's going to put me in a place where I have to then obey him and listen to him. And when I don't want to get up in the morning to pray, I still do. When I don't want to take and push the food away and fast for three days because he told me to, I still do. It's not comfortable. It's not convenient. It's not available. It's not what I flesh wants, but it's what he wants and deserves to have. And the only way that we can move from safety and move from those safe things into the realm of the Spirit is to be willing to become uncomfortable with where we're at. If you're still comfortable in the prison cage, you need to pray and submit your will before God. He set you free. Why are you stuck in that filthy place? Oh, Jesus, give us this day our daily bread, I, oh, this one makes me uncomfortable because I'm not saying you shouldn't have savings account. I'm not saying that you shouldn't follow Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a retirement fund. But I am saying if you spend more time concerned about that than you are concerned about your relationship with God, you have a problem. Give us this day. That's all Jesus said. Give us this day, our daily bread. Why? Why would he say that? I'll tell you why, in case you're wondering. Because in our country, in our world, in our time, there's coming a day that very much could happen because of our beliefs. We don't have jobs. How are we going to put food in the refrigerator? I don't know. But then all of a sudden, this prayer becomes really, really important. Jesus, this day, would you put food in my, on my table? I don't need it for a week. I need it for today. But that's uncomfortable. Because as Americans, we're really, really hyper-concerned about what the future holds. I get it. But are we putting our future trust in what we can do economically? Or are we putting our future trust in what he can do? Oh, Jesus. Forgive our debts. Uh Uh-oh. I don't like this verse at all. As a matter of fact... I think we should cut it out. Because if you offend me, I'm going to meditate on that for a while. Bless God. Really? See, we, we read this verse and we get it wrong. We say, forgive us our debts. And we hinge the fact that he forgave us our debts, which gives us the power to forgive others. It's not what he said. 
He said, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven others. Do you want forgiveness? If you've got animosity in your heart, have you got a grudge that you're holding on to? And you go to God and you do something, you go to God and say, God, please forgive me. I'm just saying what he said. From what I understand is when you go to for, ask forgiveness of God and you're holding a grudge against somebody else, God doesn't extend forgiveness. Did I, did I read that wrong? You read some of the other translations, and I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to read them, except Weymouth says, and forgive us our shortcomings as we also have forgiven those who have failed in their duty toward us. This is not some words that Jesus just grabbed and threw together because his disciples asked him a question. This was the way that Jesus prayed. So why am I speaking to this? Because I already said about safe prayers. I have so many examples of prayers in the Bible that weren't safe. Do you remember Jacob wrestling with the angel? King James in Genesis, it says he wrestled with a man, but when Jacob recounted the story later, he said he wrestled with an angel. When Hosea referenced it in his book, he said Jacob wrestled with an angel. The Jewish theologians believe that that was God manifest in flesh. You may not think of it as a prayer, but when he was wrestling and he could not prevail against that man, well, no kidding, right? He couldn't prevail, but then the angel touched his thigh and he said, I'm not going to, you got to let me go. It's almost daybreak. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I believe Jacob understood who he was wrestling with. He was facing death from his hands of his brother. He needed something. He needed it bad. The coward had taken his wives and his kids and all his belongings and sent them on ahead to meet his brother. <laughs> Here, honey, I really love you. Would you go see, talk to my, bro my, my brother and make sure he's not too unhappy with me? And he said, I'm not going to let you go and accept you bless me. That's a dangerous prayer. He'd already smote him in the thigh. From that day on, the Israelites wouldn't eat that portion of meat out of respect for what Jacob's life. Doesn't seem much to us, but the blessing was that he changed his name. Don't you ever forget that when you come to God, your name was changed. It, it's no longer Randy Wara. As beautiful and wonderful a name as that is, as honored and esteemed as that family name is, your name is now Randy Wara Jesus. And you are part of the family of God. Do you remember Elijah, old prophet? Country is overrun with the worship of Baal. He finally has enough of it, calls them all together. He had pronounced there's not going to be any rain, and it didn't rain. I don't find one place where God ever told him to say that. Maybe it's there, I just have never seen it. But God honored and respected Elijah's relationship with him so much when Elijah said, it is not going to rain for three years. Now, maybe off in the desert someplace in a cave, God said, this is what I want you to say. It's very possible, and we just, it wasn't recorded. It didn't rain. Now he gets up there with all the prophets of Baal. He's mocking them. Here's an interesting thought. I think this is not theology, this is not doctrine, but if those prophets of Baal were doing all that kind of stuff to bring down fire from heaven, in my mind, I believe they had done it before. Otherwise, why would they do it? 
the wizards of Egypt, they mimicked what Moses did up until the fourth plague. I didn't study that, so if I have the wrong one, I apologize. It's very possible they had called down fire before. In the work of Revelation, Satan's going to give power to the beast, and this inanimate object is going to come to life. So they do all they do and all that kind of stuff, and then Elijah steps over 14 words or something. Get what he does. This is such a radical prayer. He takes and he builds the altar. You know the story, but I'm going to tell it. He builds the altar. He puts the wood on it. He takes the sacrifice and puts it on it there. Then he gets a bunch of water and has them pour it on there. He says, that's not enough. So he digs a trench around the altar, and he pours another pile of water on there. And then he says, still not enough. I don't know what Elijah was expecting when he prayed. I don't know what he was, was he really anticipating that God would come down with fire and burn up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and lap up all the water? I don't know. I think he was just expecting fire, but he made it so difficult. There was no chance, any way possible that anything other than God could have represented. That's a dangerous prayer because our mentality, my mentality is, What if he doesn't come through? And so I allow the fear of what if to keep me from praying a prayer that liberated a nation from the oppressive religion of Baal. We've got to move out of safe prayers into dangerous prayers. Prayers that challenge God, if you will. Prayers that challenge the enemy. Last Saturday, you asked, what does it mean to be an apostolic? I'll tell you to me what it means. I've got to stop praying safe prayers and stay pray apostolic prayers. Prayers that challenge me. Prayers that put me at risk. Prayers that cause me, if this doesn't come through, I'm going to look foolish, but they're prayers that God will answer. (laughs) Hannah, she prayed so hard for a child that the priest was going to kick her out because she was drunk. Blind Bartimaeus was mocked and ridiculed and told to shut up, he doesn't have time for you. But he prayed a dangerous prayer. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And guess what? How many blind people lived in Israel that day? How many blind people did Jesus pass that day? How many blind people did he pass in the three and a half years of his ministry? But we know Bartimaeus by name. Why? Because he was willing to pray a dangerous prayer and put himself at risk. Safe prayers won't land us in a lion's den or a fiery furnace, but they also won't turn a nation to God. Safe prayers keep us in our comfort zone and keep God in a place where we can manage him. Safe prayers pacify our need for communicating with our creator, but also keep us at an arm's length away from his meddling influence. Safe prayers lead to safe behavior that doesn't identify us as apostolic believers, but allows us to be Christians without upsetting other Christians or the world around us. As one minister said, we're the SS of believers, secret service Christians. We believe and are practicing, but not in a way that anyone would ever know. The problem with safe prayers is that they're not. Not safe, I mean. Safe prayers don't bring radical deliverance, which we need. Safe prayers don't bring radical transportation, transformation, which we need. Safe prayers don't bring miracle signs and wonders. Safe prayers allow us to touch God and make sure that we control the relationship. God, I want you. I don't remember who has preached, maybe Brother William Sisko, two to two and a half dollars worth of God. I don't want enough that he upsets my life. 
I just want enough that I feel good on Sundays. Safe prayers. I wish I had time to explain this. I don't, but safe prayers bring power, but not authority. The Bible says you should receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But if you want authority, you're going to have to go deeper than that. Power comes to all believers. Authorities come to those who pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'm tired of power, Brother Betcher, and not having authority. As you stand, some time ago, the church where I was on the pastoral staff, it was not here. I watched as we just had this time where people just seemed to be backsliding. It's like, what's going on here? I, I, I'm going to tell you this because I know me. I don't know other people. So I, I, I'm just, let me tell this, okay? With no, I'm not trying to, anything. So for a year, for a solid year, I fasted three to five days every week for a solid year. At one point in time, I'd actually calculated and added up. I spent about a thousand hours in prayer that year. Every, every Sunday, Nothing changed Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I got desperate before God. Oh, I got so desperate. I didn't care if I ate another bite of food. Still was working full time. That was interesting. And one Sunday I was standing in the pulpit leading worship. The back door of the sanctuary opened and a young man walked in who was so far from God. In my spirit, I just, oh God, please touch him today. Don't let him walk from this place Well, renewal because I really felt like if he did, he wouldn't make it. I got done leading worship and came off and the other usher came up and said, called the young man by name and said, wants to talk to you. Okay. Walked back. In the back, there was a room, a prayer room office off the sanctuary. We walked in there. It had curtains. I closed the curtains. He began to sob. He said, I've missed it. I've lost it. I can't come back to God. I'm so, I'm so addicted to things. He began to list them all. He's like, you don't have to tell me all that. <laughs> began to talk to him, but said, you're here because God has brought you here. That means you're not too far away. It took a while of conversing with him until I finally say, why don't we just begin to pray? Just begin to seek God. Tell him everything you told me. Oh, the presence of God came into that room. He began to sob, sob and sob and sob. It didn't matter how loud he was. He didn't care. All of a sudden, he bolts to his feet runs out of the room. And I'm going, what just happened? What he did was he ran out to his car, opened up his car, collected all of his drug paraphernalia, carried it back in, and handed it to me. And I'm standing there with seven year jail sentence worth of drugs. I'm thinking, I didn't pray for this. I prayed for a clean sinner. I, I didn't pray for a dirty sinner. I prayed for a clean one. What am I supposed to do with this? It's bags of stuff. <laughs> and he falls back on his knees and begins to pray. And God, hit, before his presence was there, and then his power showed up. And if I can say it, his authority showed up. And I mean, it went bonkers. All of a sudden I realized that that whole church service that was on the other side of the glass, nothing was happening out there. It was quiet. 
I had peeked through the curtains, and every person in the congregation had turned around and was looking at the window, thinking, what in the world is going on in there? So I said, if they want to know, I might as well show them. And I opened the curtain, and the place exploded. <laughs> He gets up from his prayer, walks out of this room, walks down the aisle, and starts grabbing people by the hand. You know that scripture about compelling them to come? There was no asking here. It was, you're coming to the altar. Oops, sorry. In Jesus' name, please don't. Really, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's dragging them to the altar. The place is just... <laughs> People that I hadn't seen pray for a long, long time were on the altar weeping and crying and praying in tongues. It went for hours. If I wasn't there and didn't see it, I would have never believed it if you told me this. One of the young men started running around the church. I can believe that part. I've seen it before. But he came to the front, and as he came around the front, he ran to the pew and jumped up on the pew and ran the backs of the pews all the way to the back of the sanctuary. Came off the back, turned around, and jumped back up on the pews and came all the way back to the front with his eyes closed. You better be in the spirit. We got done praying. It was, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night. Most people had left. We decided we we're going to go to a restaurant to get something to, to eat. The problem with was that a couple of those young people couldn't speak in English. We walk in the restaurant. They're praying and they're speaking in tongues. We have no idea what they're saying. They're trying to order a hamburger and french fries, and it's coming out something very, very different. So they're pointing at the menu, and we're saying, okay, that's what they want. One of those young men it was sometime the next day before he ever was able to start speaking in English. Dangerous prayers. I can't tell you how many times I was ready to quit in that year and just say it's just not going to happen. I'm so glad I didn't quit. Right now, that young man that ran the backs of the pews pastors one of the largest churches in the state that he lives in. Serves on the district board. I, I'm not saying it was because of me. I'm just saying that what if I had it? What, I, what if I just said safe prayers? Church, I, oh my, it's five till. I'm sorry. Jesus, I want to be apostolic. I'm tired of being Pentecostal. Anyone can be Pentecostal these days. If you want to, I can teach you how to pray in tongues. I'm saying that facetiously. That's some churches. I don't want to be Pentecostal anymore. I want to be apostolic. But I have come to the understanding I can't be apostolic and pray my safe little prayers that don't put me out of my comfort zone. I prayed on the way home today, Lord, I'm going to stop at a gas station. When I get to the gas station, would you let me see somebody that needs you? I'm sorry it didn't happen. I'd love to say I saw somebody and prayed, but it didn't happen. I, I, I tried. I actually went looking. You said go look. I went looking. I didn't see anybody today. But maybe tomorrow, on my way out of town again, maybe tomorrow I'll see somebody because I don't want safe prayers. I want apostolic prayers that change the world in which I live. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Father God, I've spoken way too long. This way past time. Would you take my heart, Lord? You put this in my heart. Would you take what's in my heart and somehow transfer it into the minds and the spirits of this congregation? Savior. Savior. I know this is a Wednesday, but if something has touched you, sort of calling to you, would you follow and respond to that call and come? Shut up, Uncle. 
Oh, God. Go ahead and cry out to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.